Good evening, Pastor Gene Oller, Word of Oak Church in Katy's, Kentucky. We're glad you guys are joining us tonight. And I want to encourage you to, uh, to like and to share and to comment on weeks when you guys will share. A lot more people see the message. We want comments. If you've got prayer requests or needs in your life, you can either comment below or you can message me so that it's private so that I can pray with you. If you need to get born again, need spiritual help or need counsel, let me know. I'd be glad to help you with those things. God loves you. We do this as an opportunity or, or, uh, that we might be able to minister to you that watch on Facebook as well as YouTube. And then, of course, tonight we've got people in person here with us. And we're grateful for you folks here, too. Uh, I'm just uh, so glad that you're here in the house of God. Well, we're going to talk about grace tonight. And uh, I'm going to give you a bunch of scriptures, so it's probably easier to write them down. Or if you do Facebook, you can simply go back through and get them the second time around by pausing uh, and writing them down. But uh, we're going to talk about God's grace tonight, a very important uh, gift of God that he's bestowed upon us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, that powerful and mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we come hope-filled and encouraged because of who you are. Not because of our circumstances, not because of the political climate in our country, not because of things that may not be going right in a marriage or in a job or with children or with parents or economics, God. But we come tonight hope-filled because of you, because you're in our lives tonight, because you've made yourself known, because of your incredible, inexhaustible grace that you poured out on us. We ask for the anointing and presence and power of the Holy Spirit tonight in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Glory to God. You guys might wonder why this doesn't start at the same time. We start our in-person service right now at 6 o'clock on Sunday evenings and at 1030 on Sunday mornings. I mean on Wednesday evenings at 6 o'clock and 1030 on Sunday mornings. And we do the music and announcements, and then we bring you guys on board with us. So you don't really get to see all the service, and, and I apologize for that. But uh, it seems that with music, there are some copyright uh, issues that we don't want to get into. So that's the way we do that. But uh, thank you for being here and uh, giving you a little time so maybe you can share and get somebody else to watch with you. You can uh, set up and do a watch party. Uh, for the services, and that's an effective way to go to church at home with friends and family. I want to talk about grace. And, uh, first, I want to define two things besides grace. One is justice, and justice, if we really get justice, it means we're getting exactly what we deserve. Now, how many of you understand that when you're facing justice, sometimes you're hoping for a little mercy to be thrown in there? Anybody ever been guilty? And, and, you know, I remember a police officer stopped me for speeding a number of years ago. And, uh, and he talked to me, and he went back and he pulled my record. I'm not sure what he did. It took him a long time. And he came back, and he said, you really got a clean driving record. You, you don't have any tickets showing. And I said, no, sir. And uh, he said, but well, you were speeding. He said, it's 35 here. And I was doing about 60. And it was on the other side of a little town. And I was out of the town with the speed limit was 35 till the intersection at the bottom of the hill. And so I was speeding. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, he, he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, I'm just going to have mercy on you and let you go today. And I didn't get a ticket. I'm grateful because I deserved the ticket. And if he gave me the ticket, I wouldn't have been mad at him. Uh, it's my own fault. And then he was kind to me and showed mercy. And I appreciate that officer doing that. Uh, so justice is getting exactly what we deserve. And mercy, well, that's God sparing us from the consequences of the judgment that we deserve. Mercy is when God intervenes and uh, causes us not to suffer maybe the full weight of the judgment that we deserve. Uh, we might say, give me a break. God gives people breaks. And, and a lot of times when somebody's in trouble with the law and, and uh, they want me to pray for them, 
And, and I pray a lot of times for justice to be done with mercy. For justice to be done with mercy. Uh, and uh, so God gives us, uh, he's just, but because he's merciful, he extends mercy so that we, we rarely pay the full consequences of our sins and wrong behaviors. But grace is something else that God gives us, and that's what we're going to really talk about. Grace is something that where God is granting us favor and benefits that we simply do not deserve. Grace is giving us something we have no claim to. Grace is out of the goodness and the mercy and the love of God for and his concern over people that he extends this wonderful thing called grace. And, uh, we, we need God's grace. And the thing about it is, grace is abundant. It's available. God's not wanting to withhold his grace. He's wanting to share that grace with every person, every man, woman, woman child on the planet. He's, he's wanting to share the grace. Grace is available for the lost. And grace is available for the believer. And grace is not just salvation. But the greatest demonstration of God's grace was that God loved us so much that he sent his son who was willingly to, willing to die on the cross for our sins. He became sin so that we might become righteousness. On the cross, Jesus exchanged places with us. He died on the cross that we might be dead to sin and that he might live through us for his glory. And it's this great offer of grace that we're talking about tonight. And the grace of God, or grace that offers salvation, is for everybody, but it must be received. You have to accept the gift for it to work in your life. Titus 2.11 says, that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. Grace wants to teach us how to live. So the next verse after that says, teaching us. You see this grace of God that brings salvation teaches us something. Aren't you glad that God wants to teach us and help us to know how to live a life for him? He just doesn't say, well, get saved, do the best you can. But no, the grace of God teaches us, verse 12 teaches us, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So grace uh, extends, the, uh, extends the offer of salvation to all people, and it brings the salvation of God. It's appeared to all of us, but we have to receive it. And then that grace teaches us how to live. There's a right way to live and a wrong way to live. There are some that misunderstand the grace of God and they think God's grace is simply for the message of salvation to be declared and that we ask God to forgive us and come in our heart and then we're born again and that is the extent of grace. But the Bible says where sin abounds, the grace of God abounds that much more. The greater the darkness, the greater the light of the gospel. It's the work of grace. And grace does a lot of things for us, teaching us how to live, how to treat other people. And because grace teaches us, grace is patient towards us. Does that make sense? We're being taught by the spirit of grace. One reverse refers to the Holy Spirit as the spirit of grace. We're being taught how to uh, deny ungodliness and worldly lust and how to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. You see, it's not for later on. The grace of God empowers us to live a victorious life in Christ today. We don't have to continue on in bondage and sin. The truth is, anyone that gets born again, now sometimes I think people pray a prayer, but it's not the desire of their heart for Jesus to be Lord and Master. It's just the desire of their heart to feel better. And I don't think that brings salvation. I think it must be uh, repentance, repentance, coming in agreement with God, uh, turning from our sin with God's help. It has to be a total commitment to God, not something that has reservations on it. But it tells us in uh, verse 13 of that same scripture, Titus 2.13, that grace gives us an upward look or an eternal perspective. Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope. And the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, a 
of, our, of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And verse 14, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar or special or particular people that are filled or passionate about good works. You see, the grace of God not only teaches us to stop living an ungodly life in this world, but it gives us an eternal uh, perspective. So we look into the heavens, the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to happen one day. And he gave himself that he might redeem us from all iniquity, purchase us from all the sin, set us free, and make us a special people set apart for him. And that is a work of God's grace that makes that available to us. Grace is not for the beginner of Christian. Grace is for all walks of life and all ages of, walk, of life and all the levels of maturity in Christ. We can experience grace through a total surrender of our lives and becoming a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 4, some powerful scriptures that you may remember. But God, who is rich in mercy, there's that mercy again. And what did we say mercy was? Mercy is God sparing us from the consequences and judgment that we deserve. <clears throat> but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he has loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, has made us alive together in Christ. For by grace you are saved, and has raised us up together and made us to set together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, when would that be? Is this talking about in the future, or is that talking about now? And how in the world can I be standing here and also seated in heavenly places? Well, it's an operation of the grace and the power of God that enables us to, in a sense, live in two different realities. We live in the natural, a physical life. We touch, we taste, we we work and we live, but supernaturally, we're invited to be seated with Christ in the heavens. We have this eternal perspective. We dwell with Christ. It's a mystery of God, but yet we dwell in his presence. We can feel his presence and walk in his presence and know the Lord in a very real and personal way. And it's by the grace of God that we're saved. Verse 6 says, well, verse 6, he raises up and sends us in heavenly places. Why? That in the ages to come. He might show the exceeding richness of his grace. The richness of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith. And not of yourself. It's the gift of God. It's a wonderful gift of God. Not of works, lest any man could boast and self-righteously claim that he had earned salvation some way. It's impossible. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. For a purpose you were created, which God has before ordained in the past, that you and I should walk in this. God has a life and purpose for you. And the grace of God is not to be wasted in your life by thinking some way that now that I'm saved, God is just there to fulfill my personal dreams, goals, and ambitions Forsaking all and following Christ is what we're called to do. Denying ourselves and picking up our cross, there's grace for that. We're called to fulfill the work that God created for us in times past. Precarnate, before we were here, he created a plan and purpose for us to walk in. But it takes the grace of God for us to know that. Wherefore, we remember that in times past we were Gentiles in the flesh, separated from God. That you were without Christ and alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, separated from the promises of God with no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes afar off have been made now close because of the blood of Christ. And that's a work of grace that God has given to us. Now there's something that helps us with our grace and it's faith. Because even though the grace of God's been extended to all people, they must appropriate faith towards God. And the scripture says that God's given every man the measure of faith. Romans 5, 2 says, by whom, it's talking about Jesus, by Jesus also we have access by faith 
It's by this faith that God gives us, he allows, he puts within our heart, by faith into this grace wherein we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You see, God gives us faith, but we have to apply faith. And faith is an access into the grace of God. In fact, faith is an access into everything that's on the other side of this door. A number of years ago, uh, there was a facility in Paducah, and uh, it was located inside of another building. And I used to do some locksmith work. And for some reason, uh, they didn't want to use local locksmith. And they had me come there and do the job. And I met the man there. We went in a regular business that was operating, a business that I had purchased from. And that's where he said, meet him. And I said, I said, are you having trouble with the locks here? He said, oh, no, come with me. And we went into an office, and we went through a door, and we went down a hallway, and we went down there, and we were in a different place inside the same building. And I knew this had nothing to do with the stuff they were selling in the front. And he said, this is a secured facility. And it's very unusual uh, that we brought somebody in. But he said, you know, I'm just trusting that you will not share this. He knew I was a pastor, and he knew I did lock work. And we went into a room. He had a card he took off, and he swiped the card in a lock. And then that door opened, and we stepped into a room where they were having trouble with some locks. And they paid me uh, with a check from a different company. Not, I don't know what their name was or what it was, but it was some sort of facility. And this man had an access card. And everywhere we went, his card opened all those other locks, except the ones that they were having trouble with. And at that time, I worked on motel locks sometimes, and I had some experience with that sort of thing. That card was like faith. Faith gives us access. He could access anywhere in that building. And everything I did, the man walked with me and stood there while I did each thing. You know, everything I did, they gave me a cart to put my tools on. And I rode the tools. When I had to go out to the vehicle, they went with me to the vehicle and came back through that other business into the back. It's no longer there. I've been in that building since then, and there's nothing there now like that. But it was just a time a number of years ago that something that the government was doing was being done in that building, apparently. I really don't know. But I do know that when I received my check, it was not from the address or anything about that at all. Totally different company name, and it did not say what I did. It was just for the right amount of money uh, and a copy of my invoice. And... Uh, so anyway, faith gives us access in many things, but it all begins with faith gives us access into the grace of God. Faith is that access card. So faith and grace work together. Maybe somebody can answer this. What is something else that Paul writes continually about uh, grace and something else? What's something he puts together with grace all the time in the epistles? Two things that are commonly together. It's not faith, although faith is sometimes. The way he starts his letters, maybe that'll help you a little bit. We'll do a little jeopardy here tonight. Yeah. He starts a number of his letters, and in other statements in his letters, he says, grace and peace. In one place he says, and maybe twice, grace and peace be multiplied by the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace go together. When you walk in the fullness of God's grace, and I want to qualify that, I'm not sure that we can walk in all of his grace. It's inexhaustible. But when we walk filled with his grace by faith, we have access through grace into all the other blessings that God makes available to his people. We don't deserve any of them, but he makes us worthy. Isn't that amazing? We're undeserving, but he makes us worthy. He credits our account with his grace. And I tell you, we need to put our faith in Christ. What does it mean to put our faith in Christ to gain access to this grace? It means that we trust what God said. We take him at his word. Even when we don't understand, we just take him at his word and believe it. We stand on that. So, so faith gives us access. So you can't have grace without faith working together. And it gives us grace, access into the grace that we stand in. I can stand because of the faith and grace of God. And I rejoice in the hope of the glory of God because of that. Hey, guys, come right on in here. We've got some folks coming to join us tonight. God bless you. Yeah. Hebrews, the fourth chapter. 
the 16th verse tells us this. And, and I want to say that, that honestly, uh, the grace of God is something that we need to pursue in our life. While he extends grace, we need to value it. Does that make sense? We need to care about what God is offering to us. So Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. And that's God. You know, that's his throne. The throne of grace. We come boldly to that place. It is the flow of grace. The throne is where the grace of God flows from. And he invites us to come boldly to him. If you're a believer, you can go boldly to the Lord. You can come boldly to the Lord, boldly into his presence. I didn't say arrogantly, but you come as a child boldly. It's important. And what happens? Well, there we obtain mercy, and we find grace to help in time of need. And there's that word mercy. Remember what mercy is? Mercy uh, is God sparing us from the consequences and judgment that we deserve. And grace is God granting us favor and benefits that we do not deserve. So it's pretty awesome what God has made available. And when does he do this? Well, he does it in the time of need. Uh, Paul cried out to God about this problem he had, this spirit, the Bible says, that buffeted him. And uh, he cried out to God three times at the writing in Corinthians for God to take it away. And God said, no, but my grace is sufficient. In weakness, I am made strong. And so Paul said, well, I'll glory in my weaknesses so I might have more of God's grace is what he's saying. But God's grace is always enough. It's always sufficient. There's always plenty of it. But you notice that you need to come boldly to the throne of grace that you might obtain this mercy and grace to find help in time of need. There's sometimes I don't need much, but there's sometimes I need a lot. And I need to go boldly to God to find that. In Acts uh, 20, verse 32, it says, Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. You notice here, he said, I commend you to God and to, you know, separate them a little bit. Uh, the word of his grace, the grace of God is spoken, and the grace of God can be spoken. And we'll get to that verse in a little bit. You and I can speak God's grace. We can minister. But it is the word of his grace. What is it able to do? To build you up. How many of you need building up? How many of you have ever taken vitamins to build up? How many of you have ever went to the gym to build up? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I didn't go this year with COVID. I, I, I just quit going. But, but you know, I, I go over and swim. And occasionally lift the weights. Uh, I don't like them much, and the treadmill is so boring. But uh, I did fall down one day and get slammed against the wall, and that was fun for a moment. <laughs> it was way cheaper than going to the state fair. It had some of the same effects on me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I bet I'm not the only one that did that. If it hadn't been for the little safety tag, tag I think it would have ground away on me. <laughs> I might have lost some weight. I could have positioned properly, but I did get a good skin-up knee out of it. Well, what'd you do? Well, I got up, looked around to see how many people were watching and <laughs> pretend like I'm adjusting the machine or something. I don't know. <laughs> Nobody even noticed. They were about to pass out from running. <laughs> and I got back on there and just went a little slower. I figured the machine couldn't handle it. But <clears throat> anyway, this word of grace is able to build you up spiritually, build you up on the job, build you up in the family, build you up with whatever you need, and give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Now, I want to ask you this. When do you get an inheritance? When do you get that? I can't hear you people on Facebook, but I can hear the people in the room. If you'll yell out enough, maybe I can, or text in. When, when do you get it? When somebody dies. When somebody dies. When somebody dies. And also, uh, there's something else. When do you get it? When somebody dies and when... Well, that's the spiritual one. That's the good one. You have to be alive to receive it. Isn't that interesting? Uh, you get an inheritance when somebody dies, but you don't get it if you're dead. It goes to somebody else. And so the inheritance that's available through the gift of grace is for us while we're alive. That's not talking about the eternal life. What that's talking about here. 
God gives us an inheritance of blessings here, doesn't he? Isn't that amazing? It's good. And uh, says it gives you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. It's the work of growth in our lives. Well, I want to talk a little bit here about a negative thing about not the grace, but something can be done that's not so good. Hebrews 12, 14 says follow after follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man should see the Lord looking diligently, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up and trouble you, and thereby you, thereby you defile many other people. The grace of God can be failed in our lives. I think uh, missed. Yeah, the grace of God can be ignored. The grace of God can be squandered in a sense. And then Galatians 2, 21 says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Christ is dead in vain. So how do we frustrate the grace of God? Well, Paul is talking about the law in that chapter. He's talking about actually being crucified with Christ and Christ living through me in the life I now live in the flesh while I'm alive in this world. I live by Christ who gave himself for me. But when we try to live by the law, we frustrate the grace of God. When we try to somehow start in grace and faith and end up in works and self-effort and trying to do it ourselves, let me define that another way. Being self-sufficient. Being self-sufficient. God doesn't like self-sufficiency. He doesn't bless it. God wants us to be dependent upon him. What does that mean, dependent upon God? That means I'm going to trust God. I, I could see maybe I could do it this way, but God, how do you want me to do it? I could figure it out myself. Remember Proverbs, lean not to your own understanding. Well, I could figure it out by myself, God. I could get this. I've got it. But God doesn't want you to got it. He wants you to depend upon him. Trust him. Lean not to your own understandings, but in all your ways acknowledge him. In other words, God, I, I think I see this, but Lord, I, I'm dependent upon you. And so we frustrate the grace of God when we try to, you know, take the blessings of God, but then live our lives the way we think is best. We call the shots. We make, the, that frustrates the grace of God. Doesn't that seem odd to think of it that way? The grace of God's up there shaking his head. I don't know what I'm going to do with you, Gene. He is so frustrating, Father. Well, I don't know if it means that exactly, but we frustrate, we misuse, we, we uh, fail the grace of God. We're not walking in the grace of God. And when we do that, it's as though Christ died in vain, it says. Christ's death is in vain. He's talking to believers there, not lost people. Well, a little uh, Galatians 1, 6, and still the same sort of thing. Paul said, I marvel that you're so far removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And the other, another gospel was replacing the grace of God with religious things, primarily speaking to Jewish folks that had the rituals. But how many of you know that American Christians sometimes have their rituals? And we sometimes replace the relationship with Christ with the uh, rituals or the, uh, mm, lost the word, uh, you know, church, religion. We replace relationship with religion in our lives sometimes. And God wants a relationship. He wants a relationship. Paul was marveled that that church in Galatians had got off of the grace of God into this work. So he said, you started in the spirit, and now you're back in the law. In Hebrews 10, 29, some people don't like these verses. I had somebody recently explain that that book doesn't apply to us. It was written to the Hebrews with I think it applies to us. It talks about the 12 ways that the New Testament covenant is better in Christ's blood. How much sore punishment suppose you thought worthy who trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant of God wherewith he sanctified us an unholy thing and done despite unto the spirit of grace. And he's talking about how that in the Old Testament that... Uh, an animal could not even touch Mount Sinai where Moses got the Ten Commandments. You couldn't go up on there unless you were asked to. And if an animal or a person got on the side of that mountain, 
the guards ran him through with a spear, killed him on the spot. And he said, how much sore punishment those who trod underfoot the precious blood of Jesus. We, we do the Spirit of God a despitefulness when we willfully, wantonly continue in sin and don't repent. When we disobey the Lord and we, we put Christ under our foot and we count his blood, the blood of the covenant, uh, an unholy thing by mistreating the things of God, mistreating God, the blood. And, of course, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they sprinkled blood of the lamb on the doorpost and the ceiling of the door, the top, the header. But they did not put it on the threshold because that's where your feet walk. And he's making an analogy there. Well, what does it cost? It is to despite the spirit of grace. It is despiteful towards the spirit of grace. It's not a good thing. You can't do that and say, well, God's grace is going to cover me no matter how I live. You can't, you can't consider the blood of Jesus because of lifestyle of sin that you're living as something unholy, insignificant. doesn't matter. That's doing despite. To the grace of God, the spirit of grace. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to repent if that's our situation. Hebrews 12, 15 says, look in diligent, oh, look, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness spring up and trouble you and there foul to foul many. I read that verse a while ago with, with the other scriptures I read. I had it out of place there. I think I had it listed as Titus. But nonetheless, failing the grace of God. In other words, rejecting God, letting bitterness come up inside of you, and, and it will affect other people. 2 Corinthians 6, 1. We then, as workers together with the Lord, beseech you that you receive not the grace of God in vain. So the grace of God can be received in vanity, in vain, insincerely, you know, without any real uh, desire for the grace of God to do the work of perfection and holiness in my life, but Simply wanting the free gift, but not wanting to surrender myself to God. Well, let's end in a little better spot. <laughs> uh, how do you get the grace of God? Well, of course, it's a gift extended to all and you receive it. But there's something you and I can do to enhance that in our lives. It says in, uh, it says in James, uh, but he gives more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud. But he gives grace unto the humble. God resists the proud, and he gives grace unto the humble. How can we get more grace? How can we get more grace? Humble. humble. Humility. True humility. What will keep the grace of God out of our life or resist its work in our life? Uh, it says the God resists the proud or the prideful, those that are self-sufficient, want to do it their own way. They know how to do it. They're going to do it their own way no matter what. 1 Peter 5, 5 says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject to each other, serving one another, loving one another. Be clothed with humility. Clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. So, amen. Uh, Romans 3, 23 says that being freely... Being justified freely by his grace, we have redemption through the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 4, 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be sure to all God's children. Amen. It comes through faith. We become the seeds of Abraham or the children, the seed of Abraham by faith. And that, too, is an operation of grace in our lives. Amen. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the richness of his grace. And then Ephesians 4, 29, and this is something that's really important. I think it's good. It has to do with our conversation in church, in Walmart, wherever we go. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Let nothing that would be corrosive or harmful or damaging to somebody come out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of building up people. When I leave a place, have I left people built up or have I left them discouraged? Have I complained and fussed and moaned? Or have I spoke of the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God? Yeah. Uh, but that which is good to the edifying, that it might minister grace 
to the hearers. Your word can spread grace to other people. You can spread the grace of God to other people. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. And then uh, here's the scripture, and I don't have the reference. I've got a little glitch in my iPad today, but it's 1228, but I don't have the book. It says, wherefore we, we receive, wherefore we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. It is grace that helps us serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Some people think that grace means that I don't have to serve God in any particular way. But grace empowers us to serve God in a way that's acceptable with reverence and godly fear. Well, let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful gift of grace. We thank you for justice, Lord, which you always uh, curb with your mercy. So we thank you for justice and mercy. And, Lord, we thank you for grace. Lord, that wonderful grace whereby we're saved and we have access through faith and what Jesus did on the cross. And, Lord, tonight as I pray, I pray those listening in Facebook or YouTube now or in the future might turn to you and surrender themselves and humble their hearts before you that your grace might be poured out fully through to their life and through their life, teaching them, as the Scripture says, and teaches us that we might live godly in a way that's acceptable, Lord, to you. God, we thank you for your grace and the spirit of grace and the word of grace, that you're the God of grace. And Christ demonstrated your grace when he died for us. You so loved us. So, Lord, I just ask you to bless those that are hearing. God, those that are here, that we might, uh, Lord, press in to you. Come boldly to the throne of grace to receive help in time of need. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're watching and I can help you in any way, you'd like to know Christ, get in touch with me. I've got some resources for you. Amen. God bless you and good night.